But yeah, let's get into the news where Steve Clifford and the new executive vice president of basketball operations in Charlotte, Jeff Peterson, met with the media yesterday at 4 p.m. Eastern inside the Spectrum Center on East 5th Street here in Charlotte. And and yeah, formally announced that, that Cliff is going to be stepping down once the season is over. And I was waiting for the guy to cry. That's like, truly, and I'm like red in the face emotional and he he said something that really stuck stuck out to me which was that he just wanted to be a special ed teacher who taught and coached high school basketball and just things kept happening to him and part of what's been this has been been like in the works for a while like there's been ongoing conversations between cliff and Jeff Peterson and the new ownership group here led by Rick Schnall and Gabe Plotkin being that obviously this is a changeover time period, Mitch Kupchak exiting stage left and it's just only natural to look at maybe getting a coach that fits more of the profile of the players being that Cliff is 62 and this whole roster is 23 or, or younger basically and That being said, though, like he's just someone who is purely a teacher of the game, loves to watch film, loves to just be in the gym, on the hardwood, in the lab. And you could just see the care factor that I think, look, the NBA and like rising up the ranks and like whoever gets this job, whoever gets many a job, like the first chair is in certain respects around the league, a Game of Thrones type dynamic where you've got knives being thrown and throats being cut and all that type of stuff. And like Cliff really did and does embody the like purity and sanctity of what coaching is supposed to be, like leadership and mentorship and helping players grow. And all that being said is why I think he will be a valuable member, however he is in this next faction of being some type of advisor. There's no... They made it pretty clear that they don't. They do not have a specific role designed for him, and that's going to be a continued conversation. But he's going to be around, and I, and I do think he's going to be a really, a really valuable voice and personality moving forward, regardless of that capacity. Yeah, the, I, I'm glad you you noted the. Uh, I was I, I just expected to be a special ed teacher coach in high school. Like, that stuck out to me too. Just like the idea of. It's a John Lennon quote, right? Like life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. And then like you look up and he spent 13 years as an assistant and like more than a decade as a head coach, you know, like it's kind of wild the way that those things can evolve. The other thing I have in my notes here is just coach ass coach. Like (laughs) like what you you sort of draw up what a coach look in my head. And I think about what a coach looks like. And it's it's probably like this particular damage of having rooted for Knicks teams led by Jeff Van Gundy (laughs) and Tom Thibodeau, where it's like the vision of the coach is the guy who looks like he has never slept because he is constantly grinding tape to look for the next, you know, slight thing he can help teach a player or, you know, the, the avenue of advantage that he can exploit in the next game. But that's like a Steve Clifford team. And there, there's pl- uh, pros and cons to this. You kind of always knew what you were getting with a Steve Clifford team and that like they were always going to be organized. They were going to be like, get back on transition D first, clean the defensive glass. Don't turn the ball over like the basic fundamental stuff of successful basketball. They were always going to get that right or die trying. Um, and that was why, you know, like really also ran franchises like the post Bobcats Hornets or the post Dwight magic he got those teams to the playoffs like they were not they didn't linger long once they were there because they were always out talented but he got those teams to like the apex of what their ability could generate by the way through the way he coached the game and the way he organized his team and i think that's like one of the highest compliments you can give a coach like whatever talent you gave him he was going to get the most out of it to the best of his ability and there was you know the last two years, I think the, the record is, I mean, obviously wildly underwhelming. Uh, I believe it was 45 and 100 and 112 
through this to this point in his two seasons back in Charlotte, but he never had a team. You know, like LaMelo Ball played 58 games the last two seasons. Miles Bridges was their second best player two seasons ago, missed all of last season after being arrested on felony domestic violence charges. And Gordon Hayward missed huge chunks of time. Mark Williams missed huge chunks of time. They traded Terry Rozier, you know, midway through this season. The complete m- miss and like no, like, absolute cipher of a 2021 draft that get, got you James Booknight and Kai Jones, where like a couple of picks around them, it's Alperin Shengun, Trey Murphy and Jalen Johnson. Like I, every franchise has those misses, but like he just never had a team to coach. And he still like there was that moment of after the trade deadline this year, when they move PJ Washington, they move Gordon Hayward after they've moved Terry Rozier. And all of a sudden the Hornets are like a top five defense for two weeks. And you're like, that's Steve, right? Steve Clifford will take the ramshackle mismatched parts of whatever you give him, and it'll give you a top 10 defense just by not screwing up the small stuff. And so whatever happens next, you're, you're right. Like whatever the culture is that Charlotte wants to build, whatever version of the team, whatever form the team wants to take moving forward, if you can bring a little of that, like sweat the details, nail the small stuff, and then the big stuff can happen thereafter. Like it gives you a basis, basis and a foundation for growing. And you know, you shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater there. Like, I totally understand you want a new look moving forward. You know, many other franchises that have had their, you know, their Mark Dagna or, you know, in Washington, where maybe Brian Keefe gets that look for the way he's organized that team. Like, young guy gets his roadmap for sure. Joe Missoula in Boston, Brad Stevens before that, et cetera. If that coach can have a little bit of, of uh, what Steve Clifford's brought in him, I think that would probably serve the franchise in good stead. Yeah, the natural question is why do it now? Why announce this now with seven games left? And to your point, I think that, and Jeff Peterson confirmed as such in the press availability, there's already, and you know, Peterson came from Brooklyn where they let go of Jock Vaughn and have absolutely been making inroads on trying to f- collect intel and figure out which coaches to be interviewing. Washington's going to have a search as well. Like those are already three teams that are at least in the same type of mold of rebuilding, whatever word you want to call it. That, from my understanding, I'm going to have more of this tomorrow on Yahoo Sports Friday. I'm going to put together a coaching notebook of sorts. Like, there's going to be some steep competition, I think, for these young first time head coach assistant type guys. I mean, Jordy Fernandez, for one, mm. the associate. I think that's his title in Sacramento, who was the head coach of Canada this past summer that took the Canadian national team to the bronze medal past Team USA, the first medal since 1936 for Canada. That guy is going to be, without a doubt, getting a job this year. There's plenty of other young coaches to keep an eye on. I mean, I, I saw Chris Mannix at Sports Illustrated mention Charles Lee as a strong candidate for this position here. And there's definite connections between him and Peterson and the ownership group from his time in Atlanta back when they were all involved in that organization. So there'll be names to watch. But I I think just like the trade deadline, the coaching market functions kind of similarly in that certain teams are going to have certain wishes and they're going to overlap. And whichever thing happens first will impact the other. And it's a domino effect and what have you. So... I think there will kind of be this interesting waves of the cycle too, where you're going to have these teams who are out of the playoffs already starting to try to make this happen. And then as we've talked about time and again on the show, there are going to be postseason casualties. There's going to be a Mike Budenholzer and a Nick Nurse and a Frank Vogel and what have you. Like, like there's going to be established. Oh, there, co- there could be. There could be. Let's. <laughs> there's going to be. I no. There's going to be without wow, a doubt. Okay. Without a doubt. There's reporter two, man throwing it down. I respect it. One hundred percent, man. Like there's just there are too many teams that have real expectations that math 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 mathing mathematically they are not going to make it there. Like there's only four teams in the West who can make the second round. And there's like nine teams in the West who think they should make the second round. And the nature of the business is that the coaches are the ones who get the X when that things, when those things happen. So it's, I can't say how many, I can't say where, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking to it definitively. There's going to be at, at least one coach who's let go based off of not even, I mean, to the various degrees, you know, if certain teams 
make the conference finals and don't make the finals. That just might not be enough. So it's going to be interesting to see how all that unfolds.